Um, I'm Ed Friedman, Chairman of Friends of Merrimini Bay. I know some of you. I don't know some of you. I don't even know who's on this thing because uh, I don't know how to do this very well. But um, I want to uh, thank Martha Spies and Peace Action Maine for being our Zoom facilitators here. Um, for those that don't know what we do, quickly, Friends of Merrimini Bay is one of the only groups in Maine that looks at the environment in a holistic fashion. And so we are a land trust, conserved a whole lot of land around the bay, valuable wildlife habitat for the most part. Um, we do research, a whole variety of things over the years, circulation study of the bay, uh, aerial vegetation, land use over time, uh, work with IFMW on bald eagle nesting success. We've used caged mussels for biomonitoring locating uh, PCB hotspots and whether or not mills are still discharging dioxins. Um, the research informs our advocacy, which is pretty uh, hard edge sometimes. A lot of it focuses around um, turbine mortality uh, of fish and migratory fish restoration, uh, toxins in the, in the water, mercury, uh, PCBs and so forth again, and uh, uh, stuff like that, working on some dam removal issues. Uh, and we, uh, <clears throat> up until COVID, have a very active education program. So uh, Bay Days, getting kids out, doing hands-on stuff, uh, environmental ed twice a year, and going into classes. And so where that's going to go, we don't know, but we'll see. Um, this is, the series is also part of our education program, and first time we've done it using Zoom, which has its pluses and minuses. So. Um, People will probably ask on the way, so I'll, I'll get this out of the way uh, here. We are recording this. We, um, within a couple of days or so, hopefully a few days, Martha's recording it, I think. Um, our volunteer, Martin McDonough, will uh, get the recordings up on the website, fomb.org, down on the right column on the homepage. You can see speaker series archives, and there'll be a, a listing for this year, and you can click on this. And here's our abbreviated series for the year. Uh, next in March will be this great program, The Sonic Sea, which will be an unusual program. It, the Sonic Sea is a, an award-winning film that runs an hour. And then Chris Clark, who's a scientist who's really uh, involved in the uh, audio, undersea audio world and marine mammal world will be speaking about the film and we'll put a link up to the film. You can pay to watch it off the internet or you can just watch it through us at the time. If you watch it separately, you can come in about, probably about 8.05 or 8.10 and listen to Chris. Uh, it's a great film. And as Maine starts to look at uh, offshore wind issues, uh, we will to some extent be getting into some serious sound issues. Although if, when turbines are floating, do I think I can stop sharing my screen somehow, and then we can have oh Claire and Danielle come up. I'm going to introduce them. So uh, it's great that they're here. We really appreciate it, uh, both of you. Uh, Claire Enterline is research coordinator at the Maine Coastal Program uh, at DMR, Maine Department of Marine Resources. Um, she provides technical leadership regarding sampling methodologies, data analysis, development of scientific papers, and also works with coastal managers at the local, state, regional, and federal levels, translating scientific analyses into best management practices and plans. She is an active member of the Northeast Regional Ocean Council and the Maine Climate Council's Coastal and Marine Working Group. Current projects um, include statewide salt marsh and sea level rise monitoring program, the Maine Coastal Mapping Initiative, project to map and describe marine benthic habitat and coastwise, an approach to restoring tidal flow at restrictions using voluntary, standardized, yet adaptive, efficient, and climate resilient best practices. From 2007 to 2015, Claire's research focused on the abundance, population dynamics, habitat, and behavior of rainbow smelt. As part of this work, she was the lead author on the Regional Conservation Plan for Rainbow Smelt, 
and carried out the first smelt population assessments in Maine since the 1970s. Her research on spawning behavior and timing has led to changes in thinking and practices for how tidal culverts should be designed in order to minimize impacts to the species. Danielle Frechette is a marine resource scientist also for DMR, their division of Sea Run Fisheries and Habitat. She serves as the DMR liaison for a new citizen science effort that will track presence and absence of sea run fish in Maine's coastal streams and rivers to inform restoration and management actions. And uh, I think that'll include you know, a number of different species besides uh, smelt, which we'll hear about. Uh, Danielle is also lead biologist for the Salmon for Maine's Rivers program a new endeavor designed to help jumpstart recovery for federally endangered Atlantic salmon in Maine. She is a salmon biologist by training and worked on endangered coho salmon and threatened steelhead in California and Atlantic salmon in Quebec before landing at DMR in 2019. Danielle is especially interested in how Maine's Atlantic salmon and other sea run fishes use river habitats during spawning migrations and how well they will adopt to climate change. Okay. Folks see a presentation up now? Yep. All right. Yep. Great. Hey everybody, I'm, I'm Claire Innerline. i um, really excited to be um, with you guys tonight uh, and um, really happy to be talking about smelt. As um, Ed said, um, I, I currently am not um, focused on, on smelt or working on, on smelt, so just to put that, that disclaimer out there. Um, I work um, more on, on seafloor and salt marsh habitat, but for uh, about 12 years, um, I did focus um, almost exclusively on, on smelt and other sea run fisheries and did a lot of my research on that. So I'm gonna share with you guys some, some basic um, biology background and some of the things that, that we found in our research um, that's now eek about 12 years old. So, um, so some of the basic biology uh, smelt are, are small bodied and, and short lived. So you generally are gonna see smelt that are about six inches long. Those smelt are, are two, two years old. Uh, most smelt are two years old, um, but um, smelt do live up to five years um, and can live up to, to about 10 inches in, in Maine here. Um, they're schooling fish, so you're gonna find them together. Um, that's uh, a lot for um, uh, predator avoidance. Um, and spawning as we see them uh, in, in the in in inshore waters, but even offshore, when our trawl surveys catch them, they're catching them in schools. So they really are a um, full life cycle schooling fish. Some males do spawn at age one, and I can talk a little bit about that um, a little bit later, um, but they are fully recruited um, at age two and most um, fish that people fish for or encounter are gonna be age two. They're cold water fish. As most people know, fishing for them this time of year, um, they're feeding. They're one of the few fish that is gonna be feeding around this time, them and Tom Cod. And um, the reason that they're feeding right now is that they, they are spawning um, right at the beginning of the year. Um, so they need a lot of nutrients right now to help develop um, their gonads. They have a special antifreeze property um, in their, their gut and their cell structure so that they're able to process food um, this time of year when it's, it's the coldest. Um, and they also um, really seem to be moving north with climate change. Um, they not only are a cold water fish by, um, you know, how, how they're physiologically developed, but that, that physiological development is something that is necessary for them, for their survival. And if they, they can't have that cold water, um, that's, that's kind of changing how um, they, they behave and are able to survive. They're a really important forage species. Um, some old literature that I had found um, does uh, show them associated with Atlantic cod and Atlantic cod associated with chasing their schools around. Um, still very important prey for Atlantic salmon, trout, um, gray seals, striped bass, and many water birds. Um, one of my favorite things in the spring, um, you know, was when there was still ice uh, on the marshes and on the, um, on the streams. And, uh, you know, right at the head of tide, you would see the, the ice start to break up and, and the, um, even during the daytime, the, some of the birds that were starting to come back um, and some of the birds that, were, um, that had been there year round would just kind of sit around. They didn't care that we were there. 
because they just wanted the fish um, and they would, they were very excited to be having these fish. So smelt and tomcat are very, very important to kind of break that, that winter um, fasting that a lot of the, the birds that are year round and also the birds that are just starting to come up in the spring, um, give them the food that they need. So there are both um, anadromous and freshwater um, populations. And depending on where you have your, um, you have your thing set up. I hope you can see Maine on this map. Um, but you know, circling in here on Maine, you see this light orange and then also this darker brown. You can see that the Great Lakes are also that darker brown. Darker brown is landlocked um, uh, populations and then the orange are sea run populations. Um, they are introduced in a lot of places in freshwater populations like the Great Lakes and you can uh, Google and get lots of horror stories about some things that they've done there. Um, they are also introduced to a lot of main lakes and ponds as um, prey for Atlantic salmon. They also are historically found um, naturally occurring landlocked populations in Maine. And where that came from is as the glaciers um, were receding and sea level was rising, um, smelter are old species and um, they were there at that time. And as the sea level rise, they, they occupied that space. And then as the sea level um, came back to its current um, place, they were stranded in the, the ponds and lakes there. They've been separated so long that um, they are genetically distinct from sea realm populations. However, there's been so much stocking in freshwater um, lakes and ponds that sometimes that's, that's uh, no longer the case. So historical abundance. Um, one of the, the quotes that I, I love the most that I altered slightly for, for a word change um, from Captain John Smith in 1622. And I think this was referring um, down in Massachusetts and New York. Smelts were so plentiful that the Native Americans would harvest fish by simply scooping them up in baskets. Um, and then, you know, over 200 years later, Massachusetts in 1853, over 9 million smelt were taken from the Charles River in one year. New York in the 1870s, um, the smelt trade was over 1.3 billion pounds annually, considering these, these fish are uh, less, than, um, less than a quarter pound. That's a lot of smelt. Um, and then in Maine in 1890, they were the fourth highest landings behind lobster clams and sea herring. So our three top haven't changed too much, but that fourth spot was occupied by smelt and it supported over a thousand um, fish. But just to put that in perspective, this last line down here, already in the 1870s to early 1900s, where the amount of smelt that are found far surpasses anything we're seeing, there were already laws enacted about the concern um, and decline, and even suggestions that they should be considered in the 1870s. So to put that in further perspective, the earliest records that we have in Maine from commercial landings are in the 1880s, so this is our baseline, it's really a high number that we've never encountered again. And we go down to now. And so when we think about what the pre-colonial um, populations were in Maine, um, it's, it's a little hard to fathom knowing that um, by the 1880s, when we feel like looking back now, like, wow, that's so many, that was already um, just levels of magnitude less than what people had seen in a generation. Um, even with that, smelt remain a, a huge cultural and economic significance in Maine, both for um, spring fishing. Um, a lot of people still have um, a desire and a need for that spring, um, the, the spring fish um, and to be able to fish for them. But you know, also this time of year, um, you know, it's, a, it's just kind of a cultural icon to, to have uh, smelt shacks around, certainly a huge part of local economies, um, bait, um, identity, um, people that own the camps, people that go to the camps, um, a lot of people going to camps every single night. Um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a part of the fabric of Maine. Um, so going back a little bit to the biology, the life cycle, um, I already talked a little bit about um, the spring, uh, the anadromous species, and I'll be focusing just on the anadromous species, that the adults um, uh, are inshore in the spring and they're going up to the head of tide and they really do just go right to the head of tide and, and spawn there. Uh, the young of year are, um, uh, are presumed to go in and out um, in estuaries with mainly with the tide and then starting to be able to swim in the summer. 
then I have a couple things in, in blue here as opposed to white. And that's because that's pretty much assumed behavior. Um, so adults um, are assumed to exit into coastal waters in the, the summer. Some of the research that I did, did support that, but also there's beach sand studies that do find some smelt in the Kennebec River and in Great Bay in the, in the, sum, in the summer. And then in fall, moving back to shores, um, but they are definitely found in the bays and the mouths of rivers. You know, we did a lot of beach saning um, ourselves and um, they, they do start coming in there to the point that a lot of people that I encountered um, thought that there was, there was two spawning occurrences a year, one in the fall and one in the spring. They only do um, uh, spawn in the spring, but they really are moving near shore in the fall to the point that, that some people do see a lot of them. And in the winter, as we know, they're in sheltered bays and large tidal rivers, feeding and getting ready to spawn. So spawning um, grounds, what do they look like? Um, so here's a head of tide one. A lot of um, head of tide areas in Maine do have a, a natural ledge obstruction. Um, not all do, um, but uh, smelt habitat this is kind of quintessential where you've got boulders, um, you've got cobble, um, and you've got rock. Um, the sticky eggs that they lay um, are called what just the demersal, and they, they sink down to, um, to the floor of the stream and they stick there, They're very, very sticky. But they do need um, kind of that harder substrate to, to sit on so that they don't get rolled over and, and covered with a lot of um, silt and stuff like that. Um, canopy cover um, limits algae growth and some work that we did comparing um, over 200 um, spawning sites in Maine found that those that have intact um, can, uh, trees in the riparian area um, have better smelt populations. And we think that that has to do with limiting algae growth on the eggs and also that, that um, those intact riparian areas are um, helping to filter a lot of the runoff that's coming down at that time. They slow the water and then they're also filtering um, pollution and, um, and nutrients. The pools and riffles created by these rocks oxygenate the water. They allow resting and spawning areas. Um, what you'll see a lot of times is uh, a female sitting right above um, a riffle and a rock in, in that kind of nice pool area and males gathering around her and then her um, releasing her eggs. And the thought is that that's helping to oxygenate the eggs right before they settle. And then also um, to disperse um, both the, the milt and the eggs. So question that, you know, I think uh, a lot of people have is, do they go in between streams? And the answer is yes and no. Um, so spawning site fidelity can be low in certain areas here. And I have um, Taunton Bay up here just as an example. And one of the, the things that we found with, with tagging um, smelt um, and then looking at where they went in many different places and actually did this in Great Bay, that they, they do seem to be going back and forth between most of the rivers in Great Bay. Um, and in the St. Lawrence River, which is the figure over here on the right with the pie charts, I just think this is so interesting. Um, northern side of the river is genetically distinct from the southern side of the river. But the southern side of the river um, had species, had or had populations that were interspersing during spawning, and the northern did, but they stayed separate on other sides of the river. So interestingly, um, they're um, certainly are documented cases where smells are choosing um, to be in a certain place, but within that place going into multiple streams. Um, and then other places like Great Bay, where it seems like all of them are going into to every, every place. Um, we did do some genetic studies for um, the, the whole Gulf of Maine from Copscook Bay down to Buzzards Bay. And the what this map shows is the different places where we, we took smell um, over um, a few years. So this is genetics from, from a few years um, combined. So we, we hope that that's a fairly stable signal. And the different colors on these uh, bars over here are showing um, the separation. So a similar color up here, like the blue in down East Maine, and then that similar blue coming down here in, in Great Bay and, and in Ipswich means that those have a, uh, a um, a comparative genetic signal. Whereas these yellow down here um, in Plymouth Bay and in Buzzards Bay are genetically distinct. Penobscot Bay was genetically distinct. 
Cobscook Bay was genetically distinct, and then Casco Bay um, was genetically distinct, but with the, the least strong signal. So how do we explain that? We explain that by looking at the, um, the oceanic currents in the Gulf of Maine. So the currents in the Gulf of Maine come from east to west. The EMCC is the Eastern Maine Coastal Current. The WMCC is the Western Maine Coastal Current. What happens at the Penobscot River is that it starts going offshore. And also um, water from the Penobscot Bay starts coming down. But a small amount of that does go past um, the Penobscot River um, down into Great Bay, but then around um, Cape Ann in Massachusetts, um, it starts going offshore again. So um, that's why we think that some of the signal from down east coastal was found um, down in, in Great Bay and Ipswich Bay, and bypassing um, Penobscot Bay and Kennebec because you have those big freshwater areas that are pushing that water off so that any kind of larvae or juveniles or adults that are not strong swimmers um, might not be able to, I guess, kind of make it past those rivers and they kind of go offshore. Um, and then also why there's distinct signals in, in Boston and then um, in southern, um, uh, southern Massachusetts, uh, maybe with some mixing um, from the Cape Cod Canal and fish going back and forth there. So this may explain why we see some differences in sizes. So, um, it's kind of looking at looking at the size of, and we looked at age two males because that's what dominates the, the spawning runs. Um, males come back many, many times to spawn. And so we get to see those age two males again and again and again. And so we really have a firm idea of what size they are when they're age two. So you would think that the um, smell to age two in Massachusetts would be the biggest and then going up and being smallest um, in, in East Bay. And that would be because when they're um, in the Southern areas, they get to grow faster, there's more food and in the Northern areas um, uh, where the water's colder, they're not growing as fast. This is a typical thing that, that we see. But what we saw was, was not that. Um, what we saw was that um, in Shoppy Brook, um, which is on the down East um, uh, coast, that was that was more similar to the sizes that we were seeing down in um, in Casco Bay. Um, the fish down in Massachusetts were the largest at age two, um, but the um, fish in Penobscot Bay were the smallest, um, not the ones in in down east Maine. And we think that that has to do with some of that that mixing of genetics and um, you know who who's what populations are tied to which. So the, a lot of the work that I did was on um, what I call repeat, within season repeat spawning. So these are fish that during the same spring are coming back over and over again to spawn. And we know that the male smelt um, visit the spawning grams multiple time within the same season and that they, they're what's called batch spawners. So they, they physiologically can spawn multiple times. Females, um, are more li likely to ovulate during one spawning event. However, it is known to occur that they can um, maybe spawn at consecutive nights. Uh, and we know that multiple males attending to one female increases fertility success. And so evolutionarily, that's probably why um, they've come to be like this. Um, so we, we tagged these fish to get an idea of how often they were doing this. I'm not gonna present that here, but what I do wanna present is a, an interesting finding that we, we didn't expect. Um, we were just looking at how many times these fish come back to spawn, but what we found um, was that um, because the tide cycle shifts, so you always think of smelt spawning um, nighttime, high tide, but high tide doesn't always happen at night. So, you know, depending on where the tide cycle is, it might happen at 4 a.m., might happen at 5 a.m., might have happened at 5, you know, 5 p.m., so high tide is not gonna happen in the darkest hours. So what we found was that as the tide cycle shifts during the spawning season, um, smelt um, changed their behavior to not necessarily always go with the tide, but to, um, they preferred being there at the darkest hours. So sometimes they would come up to the, um, the spawning stream, try to get to the head of tide while the tide was coming out or when it was low tide. Um, so a third of all return, uh, returning tag, um, tag smelt made movements against the tide to be at the spawning grounds during darkness. Put that in perspective with the, an estimated two thirds of our road crossings end 
and in smelt habitat, so um, in those tidal areas, um, are perched, um, have velocity barriers at um, low tide, or have other issues that is going to totally prevent or make very, very hard smelts movement um, to be at their um, spawning grounds at um, when they need to be there. So as I kind of started with, um, smelt are, are declining populations. Um, some of the possible reasons for decline would be historical overfishing. Um, ones that we documented were threats to habitat like obstructions, um, water quality, high nutrients that are um, leading to algal growth on the eggs, but also in some areas, um, high levels of metal in the water that might be affecting adult physiology and, and also um, egg physiology and, and um, survival. Um, habitat degradation, so channelization, um, that we see that more in Massachusetts, but also, you know, uh, you know, cutting trees around the riparian area, things like that. Um, I say unknown because there has been no direct research um, around these. Impacts of climate change, um, habitat loss at other life stages, uh, like what are they doing in the ocean? What do they use there? Marine predation, um, bycatch susceptibility specifically in the ocean. And um, then another question that is just kind of one that would affect all of our understanding of this is how does their behavior influence um, the survey data and the population data that we have? In 2004, they were listed and are still listed as a federal species of concern. And in 2015, um, they were listed um, within the state wildlife action plan as a species of greatest concentration need. So that's what I have. Um, I think we were gonna hold questions and I was gonna turn it over to um, Danielle now. All right, are y'all seeing my screen now? Great, thank you, Claire. Um, and actually, can you see the boxes with your faces on them too on my screen or is that just in Zoom? You don't see those, That's you just see the screen? Yes, just the screen. In, Perfect, uh, okay, I've always, I've always wondered if when I have the bar so I can like see people's faces and kind of gauge whether I'm going too fast or not. I have always wondered if, if you guys could see that box of faces, it's good to know, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna kind of turn the, the tide of this talk a little bit to talk a bit about how um, we survey for smelt, how we collect the data that's needed to manage and restore the species in the state. So there are three kind of key survey types that we're using. There are krill surveys during the winter ice fishery, there are population studies, which um, the data that Claire was talking about, the findings she was talking about came from a lot of those population studies. Um, and then we have surveys during the spring spawning season. I'm gonna to briefly touch on the creel surveys and the population studies. We're gonna focus mostly on the spring spawning. And why is my slide not advancing? There we go, okay. Um, so if you have gone smelt fishing during the winter, you may have seen a DMR biologist stop by your shack and ask to measure your fish. Um, these krill surveys were initially started in the, the 70s and early 80s, and they were resumed in 2009, and they're a fishery dependent measure of how the population is doing, um, which means that the data that we collect, the information we get from it depends on the fishing effort. So that what's being collected is a subsample of up to 100 fish per angler. And what we're looking for are how large are the fish, so their length, um, what's the sex ratio, males to females. A scale sample is collected that lets us know the age of the fish, and then a fin clip is collected for genetic stock structure for the types of analyses that Claire was speaking about. Um, the biologists will also record the number of anglers, how many hours they spent fishing, and the number of lines that they fished. And then using these data, they can estimate the numbers of fish that are staging prior to spawning using what we would call catch per unit effort or CPUE. And in this case, it's the total number of fish that are caught per line hour. 
Um, these krill surveys aren't getting at the actual spawning fish though. This is these, the fish that are being caught during the winter ice fishery are the ones that are coming into the rivers and staging and, and feeding and, and pu putting on all that nutrition to build up their, their gonads before spawning. The population studies are a fishery independent measure, and this is where we're starting to get at what's going on on the spawning grounds. So these surveys have been conducted using FICNET, so that's that kind of mesh trap box that you see in the photo. Um, these surveys were carried out from 2008 to 2015 in six locations throughout Maine, and they're designed to be representative of the spawning grounds. So now we're seeing the fish that are actually on the spawning grounds. And so the fish that are getting caught in that box, when we, look, we can look at the size, the age, and the sex of the fish that are spawning, take that genetic sample, that fin clip for looking at genetic population structure, um, looking at how large the fish are given their age, um, looking at that repeat spawning that Claire was talking about, about via tagging, um, and then looking at the spawning sites itself. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that because Claire really did a great job of, of talking about what came out of those studies. Um, moving on. Whoop. So the spring spawning studies are the ones that surveys are the ones that I'm going to be talking about. Um, these are another fishery independent measure. Um, and what's happening during these surveys are, are actual observation of fish spawning in our coastal streams and rivers here in Maine. Um, so looking for eggs or spawning smelt themselves. Also collecting data on the spawning habitat that the first year using. What's the substrate like? Are there obstructions to fish passage? Um, culverts or road stream cross crossings that might be blocking access or those natural um, ledge type barriers that would have defined the, the natural extent of the spawning run. Um, this gives us a measure of how strong the spawning runs are. So we're looking at the size of the egg mats or the number of spawning adults. So these spring spawning surveys were first carried out in the early 1970s and 80s, and they were resumed in 2005 and 2007 to 2009 by DMR and Marine Patrol. And what came out of these surveys were 279 streams were, uh, were examined. And it was found that only 19% of them still supported what would be considered strong spawning runs relative to the surveys that were done in the 70s and the early 80s. Unfortunately, most of the streams had smaller spawning runs or no longer supported spawning. And that was not even across the state. So the spawning decline was concentrated in the southern part of the state, Lower Casco Bay, Kennebec River, um, and the east side of Frenchman's Bay. However, spawning runs were still strong in Northern Casco Bay, um, St. George's, Penobscot Rivers, and around the Pleasant Bay and Cobscook Bay. And so now that this leads us to a new set of surveys. These are citizen science surveys. Um, and the reason we want to focus on citizen science surveys is that 297 streams is a lot of streams to cover. Um, that's a lot of effort, a lot of boots on the ground and spread out across a very large, a very large coastline, 300, 478 miles of coastline to be exact. Um, and so citizen scientists can work together with our, our state biologists to get more boots on the ground and cover many more of these streams in a, in a given year. My mouse is misbehaving, apologies. Why are we going backwards now? There we go. All right. Um, so the citizen science, uh, citizen scientists got involved with the spring spawning surveys in 2015. Um, the Downey Salmon Federation worked with DMR to tweak the protocol that was being used to make it a little bit more user friendly for anyone to do. Um, and the effort was led by DSF in Washington and Hancock counties. Um, in 2020, a new joint effort was launched that refreshed the protocol using the same basic data that DMR and DSF were, were conducting. Um, you may have seen this article about the effort in the Portland Press Herald last spring. 
and the survey is being housed through the Ecosystem Investigation Network, which is part of the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. So the, the whole premise of the Ecosystem Investigation Network is to understand how climate change is affecting the Gulf of Maine watershed. And so they host a, a, series, a, a suite of citizen science projects um, that just do a, are looking at a wide range of things from striped bass to smelt to tomcod. Um, and so our smelt survey is, is one of these projects. The goal of the spring smelt spawning citizen science survey is to conduct a long-term scientifically rigorous survey coastwide to identify where spawning, smelt are spawning in Maine and where they're not. And our goal is to connect the people of Maine to sea run smelt in our tidal streams, the science of monitoring these fish and to each other um, because we're all essential partners in the stewardship of the habitat that support these fish. When the surveys are conducted depends a little bit on your geography. Um, smelts are spawning a little bit earlier west of Penobscot Bay and a little bit later east of Penobscot Bay. And, but in general, we're looking at late winter, early spring into the kind of the late spring. The run itself may last only a few nights in a given area. So visiting your stream regularly is pretty important. And where? Your local stream. So we're looking for citizen science volunteers to help us survey any of the 297 current and historic smelt spawning streams in the state. Um, we're especially interested in streams that have historic data, but not current data. We'd really like to, to start filling in some of those, those holes where we knew it was going on in the past, but we don't quite know what's going on right now. Um, we're asking people to, to choose sites that are easily accessible to them or to, and to ask us for recommendations if you don't know where your local stream is. Um, how to get involved. Uh, we ask people to complete a Sea Run Smelt Citizen Science survey training. Uh, the tentative date for that survey training is March 3rd. It'll be held via Zoom. And then once, once participants are trained, you're asked to head down to your stream with a partner following our current COVID guidelines. Um, so with your family group, with your pod, um, either at night to look for the smelt spawning as they come into the streams or during the day to look for their eggs. Uh, the data is collected on paper data sheets. And then once at home, the data is entered into that ecosystem investigation network data entry portal that I showed you and that that data gets transmitted to us. So these, the participation of citizen scientists will really help us get a handle on the pulse of smelt here in Maine um, and help us to identify undocumented runs, uh, prioritize streams for restoration actions, either enhance, doing population enhancements or replacing culverts. Um, this is a culvert that was uh, photographed by actually one of our Tom Cod volunteers uh, just a few weeks ago. And this is an egg bed that um, was documented after a road stream crossing was removed on smelt stream in Perry. So this is kind of an example of what, uh, so this is not the same culvert that I just showed you. This is, this is one that was restored um, a couple of years ago. And, is really a nice uh, positive illustration of what can happen when we know where smelt should be, but aren't because there's something in their way. So if you want more info on the survey itself, um, you can head over to the Gulf of Maine and ecosystem, excuse me, Gulf of Maine Research Institute Ecosystem Investigation Network page. Um, we have a smelt spawning page there where you'll see a project overview. Um, you'll also have direct information to contact myself and the other um, project partners. And I did briefly mention that we also have a Tom Cod survey, which just wrapped up. Um, it's a really fun thing to do during the winter. So if you're on that GMRI ECOI net page, you can also take a look at our finding, finding frost fish survey and then look for a training for that coming next year or later, excuse me, at the end of this year. Um, so with that, I'll put Claire's and my contact information up there and then turn it over for questions. Well, thank you, Danielle and Claire, that's great. 
Um, I don't have the questions. I am um, assuming that Martha and maybe her husband, Arthur, have them. Hopefully they're on. Martha, there aren't any questions yet, but I think if, um, if Danielle can change from sharing screen or yeah. maybe we can all view each other and gallery view and see if anyone wants to raise their hand. I, I have a question actually, <clears throat> not, not a good hand raiser, but um, with the think, thinking about the Bay tributaries, most of which are not very cobbly here, um, but clearly there's a lot of smelt, you know, in the Bay <clears throat> and in the tributaries. I'm wondering about um, culverts and do culverts, have you found that, that good culverts um, not perched culverts, do they end up being uh, uh, used for spawning well, and well used given that they're dark and they're, you know, a hard surface and kind of ripply with the, with the corrugations in them? Um, it depends on the culvert. And, um, so um, if, they're, if they're ripply and corrugated and, you know, or a, a smooth bottom, that, that's not great. Um, but I have seen um, smelt trying to spawn um, there, but the the velocity of the water kind of pushes them back. Um, so what really needs to happen is it needs to be embedded um, or bottomless, which means that you know you have two abutments and it's it's like a bridge kind of a culvert, yep. um, and that it's a natural stream bed down at the bottom. They will a lot. We're really really good at building roads that go right overhead of tide. Um, we just were as humans, fantastic at doing that. And, um, so if you replace a culvert with a bottomless culvert, um, that has natural substrate in the bottom that is, you know, more than, and here's the catch is that for, for freshwater streams, the idea of 1.2 bank full width, you might hear that a lot. Um, so that's, it spans the, the stream bed, but also goes beyond that a little bit. So it allows for that, that spring, um, water to come in. And in some small sites, they, you know, you are just fresh water, so that'll work um, because that breaks up kind of the, the heavy flows that are coming down in the spring. But at a lot of um, the culverts that we have in tidal areas, that's not enough, you know, because you've got the tide coming in and going out. And um, if you have a, if a um, it's, if you have the tide higher at one side and it's going to change than the other side, that's going to cause a really big problem so that that you can't have a rule of thumb necessarily for sizing. Um, those need to be looked at at a case by case basis. And um, there's a, a um, group of folks in, in Maine that um, are working on that. If you're interested, if you have a culvert that you would, is it a title culvert that you'd like to look at, please feel free to get in contact with me and I can put you in charge of um, the project manager and that project is, is called Coastwise. Thank you. <clears throat> We've got Josh. We've got Joshua's question next, and then a question from Kevin after that. And if you have a question, could you pop it in the chat or raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you, Martha. So my question goes, I've got two questions. You can team tag them if you want. One has to do with eDNA, which I know is being um, sort of sequenced to develop the primers for smelt. But I'm wondering, um, besides the joy and great inspiration of seeing adults and seeing eggs, does that hold potential for getting more and better data in the near term so that we could get better information up and down the coast? The second question is related as we see perhaps Southern Maine start to blink out or some of the warmer pockets. Um, is there any thought that we should be thinking about minimizing our impacts on their populations? Thank you. Sarah, do you wanna start? I'll let you start. Um, okay. yeah. So the, from what I understand, the primers are well developed for the eDNA work um, and the assays are, they, uh, the sampling methods are, are really getting there and, and well designed for citizen scientists to implement. Um, one of the challenges is the cost of running the samples. And so one of the, one of the key challenges would be making sure that we had funding to support a, you know, a widespread eDNA sampling program. Um, where it shows a lot of promise, I think, is when we've done a restoration action 
and monitoring that. So if we have a specific site that we're looking at where we it's been targeted for restoration, really doing some eDNA sampling both before and after that um, restoration action could really uh, give us a lot more information on, on how well it worked or, or really knowing that there were not fish above the obstruction before, but there are afterwards. And then maybe Claire, do you want to take yeah, the second I, uh, part of the question? second part of your question, Josh, um, and let me see if I am getting this right, rephrasing it as like, what can we do as people? I'm yeah, just wondering if, if human pressure might be a tipping point if a population is pretty much at the edge of its maybe temperature range. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll tell you right now, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to talk about fisheries um, and I'll let Danielle talk about that if she wants to. Um, I can only talk about habitat. Um, so uh, for habitat, certainly um, if there's a, a population that's, that's not doing very well and you know it has a especially bad spring with warmer water temperatures or um, you know, if that's the spring that people decided to fertilize their lawns more and there was a high temperature and a lot of algal growth, that can really take a toll. Um, so yes, I think that, you know, populations that are already declining smelt have about a, a six to, to eight year cycle of going up and down just naturally. And so if you have a population that's not doing well already and down at the bottom, then, um, you know, if a, a habitat, something that's forcing the habitat to not be so great can really have an impact. We have a question from Kevin Wigan and the next one after that would be a comment and question from Sam Lambert. Hi, uh, I was wondering if, uh, if how salinity impacts uh, smelt uh, reproduction. Um, Danielle, do you want to, and there was also one in the chat about sexing. Um, so uh, I'll just do the, the sexing one real quick, Sam, before your question. Yeah, um, so that's, that question is from Kevin Wig, and I, I don't know whether he's unmuted or not, but yeah, question from Kevin Wigan yeah. is, how are you sexing the smolt, smelt? Is there any sexual dimorphism or are just opening them? Is this question. So there is sexual dimorphism um, uh, in a couple of ways. Females are larger than males. Um, during the non-spawning season, it's, it's really hard to tell the, the difference and you do have to cut them open. During the spawning season, um, males have um, uh, nuptial turbicules, which is my favorite. Uh, and so they're bumpy on the outside um, and the females are very smooth. Um, and then Sam, um, your question about salinity. Um, so the, the lab and field trials that we did found that the eggs, um, we did not, I don't know about adults. We did not do um, adult um, field trials or lab trials, but the, um, the eggs um, we did and they can, um, they can take um, salinity pulses. Um, so basically if the tide's you know, coming in and they're, they're covered. Nothing was by 32 um, that we found in the, the field. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, um, but with sea level rise, it could. Um, but that pulses of, of up to 20, um, the eggs survived if it was um, less than six hours. If it was more than that, um, they did not do very well. Um, down in New Hampshire and Great Bay, where there are uh, a couple of sites, um, although some of them are, are uh, there's no dams there anymore, but there were dams right at the head of tide and the smelt, um, the eggs were right below it and subjected to um, pulses of, um, of um, saline water. Um, you would get, you would see some mortality, um, especially uh, um, during really dry springs where there was not as much fresh water pushing and the water was saltier coming up. Sam also had a comment about culverts tending to be a velocity gradient problem for most anadromous fish. Is that something that he was asking you to discuss as well or just an observation? Um, yeah, I, I think the, uh, the culvert thing, I was just adding to the concept that culverts are impactful to uh, you know, 
anadromous migratory species uh, in general. Um, anyone else didn't get a question that they wanted to ask a question if, if you can raise your hand or post it in the in the chat. Vance, go ahead, Vance. And you have to unmute yourself. Too. Okay, I, I didn't know if you were in charge of muting or not. Um, so, you know, the, the footprint of smelt just seems to be shrinking. And I'm curious whether, um, because you'd point out about how the, the currents, the, the oceanic currents impact, you know, their dispersal. Is it because the, you know, is it the southerly currents that prevents them from sort of moving up north to colder water? Or is there some other factor that's sort of, you know, rather than them moving north to colder waters, there's some reason why they're just collapsing? That's a great question. Um, and I don't have a full answer, um, just to put that out there. Um, you know, what, what my um, experience and understanding and, and research would tell me is that, um, because of, you know, there's some, there is some movement, you know, but we think that that's mainly at the larval stage and due to the currents and that current, you know, in, in uh, Maine is, is, is east to west. Um, populations in, in Canada, um, some of them are stable, some of them are decreasing. Um, so, but as far as um, adult smelt in the ocean, making a very large movement, you know, northward, um, we do not, we don't know if that happens. We don't think it happens, but I would say that that is a um, unknown research question. Anything else out there, Martha? Uh, none uh, in the chat that I see. Oh, Casey. Casey Cottle has a question. Go ahead, Casey. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, I was wondering what the pollutants of most concern were to the uh, reproduction of smelt. Are they PCBs or mercury or something else? Certainly PCBs and mercury are of great concern because of um, you know, a known, um, known impact on physiology and reproduction. Um, we did find PCBs and mercury in adult tissue um, for um, smelt in the Kennebec and Penobscot in, May, in Maine, and then some others in New Hampshire and, and Massachusetts. But there are other um, pollutants, specifically metals that are in the water um, that we see at uh, more urban sites or sites that um, don't have um, a lot of uh, natural um, areas um, in the, the watersheds and specifically in the 350 feet around the streams. And those metals of most concern would be ca cadmium, um, that uh, binds as calcium would. And so the eggs are not as strong and they can break. Um, nickel um, inter intervenes with um, physiological development. And um, yeah, and then obviously, obviously lead. Um, but other, other ones, you know, depending on their levels can, can certainly um, affect um, uh, embryo development. Um, maybe not to the point of killing them, but to um, significantly um, hinder uh, larval and, and juvenile development. I see Michael Wing is unmuted. Michael, did you have a question or? Yes, uh, yes, please. Uh, where can I find a list of the 297 streams? The map of the streams that I showed is in the, um, oh gosh, Claire, remind me of the name of the report itself. The Regional Gulf of Maine Conservation Plan for anadromous smelt, not freshwater. Thank you. <laughs> um, that map is in there. Um, and I don't know, do we have a list of the streams somewhere? I've not actually seen a full list. If, if people want to volunteer, it helps to know the name of their, they, they usually know the name of their local stream. So that would be a good thing to to have. Yeah, so maybe you can help this way. I'm on the Abacadasset River, which is really a stream where I am in Richmond. Is that too far away from the Kennebec River to be useful? Well, well th th this is Ed. 
uh, if um, if you're above the Abigadasset Falls, it wouldn't be appropriate because there's a 30 foot falls, but uh, there's a, clearly a good smelt fishery on the Abbey. So I would guess that's probably a, a good spot below the falls. And we've got Thank a couple, couple more questions lining up here. We've got one from Nate Gray, um, one from Eric Hutchins, and an another from Sam Lambert, if we can go in that order, Nate. Hey, can you hear me? I'll do that. Okay. I was wondering, Claire or Daniel, have there been any any attempts to to reestablish a smelt run in part of their southern range where they've been extirpated? Not as far south as Chesapeake as you have there. Um, the farther south that that I know, or any of them that I know of are um, Massachusetts um, and New Hampshire. Did any of them take? Had some in Maine, obviously, but yeah. Did any of them take uh, the ones that they tried to reestablish? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the, the ways that, that we were doing it then, um, that Massachusetts developed um, was to, to um, stock eggs that they had, had strip spawned. So you take the adults, they're spawning, bring them into the lab, strip, you spawn them in the lab you um, put um, oxytetracycline, which is a antibiotic, um, but it also, for those of you who, who may know oxytetracycline from um, getting it as a child for an as antibiotic, it can make stripes on your teeth. Um, and um, it makes stripes on the, the otolith, which is the ear bone of the, the smelt. So anyway, so they could monitor their success. Um, and they, they did recapture um, some smelt that had um, OTC marks on their otoliths. So it, it did work. Um, yeah. Thank you. So I've got Eric Hutchins next. Can you unmute yourself? I don't yes. You um, my apologies in case you cover this in your presentation. I was at a hearing and came on late, but I just uh, spurred a question. Um, I put it in the chat box, but thinking about all the concern up in, say, the St. Croix, for example, with increasing striped bass populations chowing on, or potentially chowing on uh, salmon. What actually has been cropping up with the predator prey situation with, um, with striped bass in general? What, what is the interrelationship with striped bass and rainbow smell? Eric, that's a great question and I don't have a full answer for you. Um, I would strongly um, advise any, I think Connecticut River was doing some on that with the, the smelt coming up and, you know, to the, the dam there and then the striped bash. But that was done more on river herring, so it was done later. So everything I know of is done later. Um, and I think a lot of that is because that's when the striped bass are here. So I don't know of interactions, what the, I don't know what the, uh, I guess, you know, effect of the interaction between smelt bass, striped bass and, and smelt is because the adults are usually gone, but um, they could be chowing down on the juveniles because the juveniles are definitely there in the summer, but I do not know of any studies. There have been some studies recently on the Miramichi River in New Brunswick, and I'm not sure the findings on those. Um, I'd have to dig back in I can't remember what those were. I do know um, a colleague and grad student, co-grad student of mine did a study on looking at a cormorant colony at the mouth of the Restigouche River, um, looking at whether they were predating on salmon smolts. And they found that almost all, pretty much everything that those cormorants were eating was rainbow smelt. Um, and they, there are very few smelt total. So at least on the Restigouche, this rainbow smelt were acting as a prey buffer for um, for the, the Atlantic salmon smolts. That was done by Joanie Carrier a couple of years ago. Okay, next um, we can circle back to Sam's question about Mary meeting bay streams. And then there's a comment from Vance. And then I see a comment about Nick Bennett that we should probably all hear about. So um, go ahead, Sam. 
Yeah, I, I was just curious to know in uh, the Merrimie, uh Bay system, sort of what what streams are the healthiest. Obviously, there there are a couple of good ones, but probably hear from you. I'll let you take that one, Claire, because I'm not super familiar with the Mary Meeting Bay Area yet. I'm yeah. a bit further north so far. Yeah. Uh, so in, in Mary Meeting Bay, um, there's a there's a lot. Um, you know, it, it seems like um, it seems like a lot of the the spawning um, might be happening in the the main stem of some of the the rivers. But Catcan Stream is one that that comes to mind um, right off the top of my head. Um, I'm also going to say I have not um been i haven't had boots as um was it you who made the comment um in i haven't had squeaky boots in this in a smelt stream um for for over eight years so um you know i i really would um refer back to to the smelt biologists at um at dmr about that for current that's do you do you want to in case some people can't read what you've got in the chat do you want to make your comment <laughs> <laughs> I was just goofing. I, mean, I said, you know, you, you you both, I think, made the comment that, you know, your effort needs boots on the ground, and I applaud that, but uh, you don't really need boots on the ground. You need squeaky boots in the stream. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Um, here's Nick Bennett to tell, give, keep us informed of something coming up. Thanks, Martha. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope it's okay that I bring this up, but it seems like the right crowd. Um, I just want to let everyone know that on Tuesday, at, starting at 3 p.m., there'll be a hearing, a public hearing on Department of Marine Resources proposed amendment for the Kennebec River Management Plan relating to anadromous fish. And it's an excellent plan. Um, it actually recommends removal of the uh, Lockwood and Shawmut dams. Um, there is strong opposition out there to the plan, unfortunately. And um, it would be really great for folks to show up, uh, sign up for the hearing and testify in support of the plan. Um, DMR needs support for this as well as for all of the other great work they do. And um, we heard about some of it tonight and I think it'd be great if people can help out with um, trying to get this uh, amendment that they're proposing passed. And I put um, a couple of links um, in the chat, one where you can register for the hearing and the other where you can um, get some talking points on the plan. And both of them, I think, have a link to the plan in it um, or the plan amendment. It makes for a great read. And uh, thanks. I don't want to take up too much of everybody's time, but I thought maybe this would be a crowd that would be interested. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate you bringing that up. And I, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a deadline of February 26 for written comments. Is that right? Yes, that's right. 10 days after the hearing, you have to do written comments. And and people can find a link for where to send those on your website as well. Yep. The same link right there that has the uh, uh, talking points for, um, for what you could say at the hearing also is has a way to submit written comments. It's always good to show up in person though, even if it's virtually. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. So I don't see any further questions. Um, Claire and Danielle, do you wanna have any last comments before Ed closes us down here? I guess my last comment is that I'd love to see some of your faces again at our uh, smelt training in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, again, the tentative date is the third, um, but you can shoot me an email if you're interested and I'll make sure that you have the invite link for that uh, training. Great. Well, thank, thanks so much to, 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 to you, Danielle, and to you, Claire, and, and uh, to everyone who came. And uh, <clears throat> Again, we hope to have this up available on our website sometime in the next few days. And I invite you all to come back and, and see us on the second Wednesday of next month and hear about you know, major effects of underwater sound that are going on and the impacts that 
that is having on our sea life. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Right, thanks, everyone.